thanks for having me, and, and thanks for all you guys for showing up. I, I have to say, I just found out these guys get, got together, get together like once a month for some breakfast club thing. Um, so they were like jabbering in the back in the corner. It was hard to actually get them to move. Um, it had the horrible name of CEO Forum. Yeah, it's really clever. Yeah, yeah I don't know. You guys got to change the name of that. Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> so these guys know each other well. I'm going to introduce them. Um, before I do, you guys have heard from the sort of the finance crew, what CFOs think of customer success. You've heard from investors, what the VCs and, and the, the money folks think of the customer success. The finance crew thinks about customer success? Uh, well, they think about paying for it, well, okay. whether they should, yeah, you, and what their returns it? are. And right. um, so now we're going to hear from the, the CEOs and, and really what from your perch. Um, so let me just go down the line and introduce you guys. Introduce you guys. Um, starting with you, Mr. Chris Cabrera, um, who is the CEO of Exactly, um, sales compensation management, management SaaS company. And before that, you were the CEO of, what was it, Calidus, right? Another I compensation. Was, uh, SVP Bob. SVP, yeah. okay. USC oh. Die Hard, which leads me to. <laughs> Aaron, who is a USC dropout. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we, have and, uh, we have the die hard and the dropout. Yeah. Um, Aaron Levy, CEO of Box. Um, we all know Aaron. If you don't follow him on Twitter, you should. Then don't. Uh, <laughs> oh, then don't. All right. At Levy. You should anyway. Um, uh, next to Aaron, we have Tian Zuo, um, who is the CEO of Zwara. And I knew Tian more, and you guys are probably all familiar with Zwara. Um, they, uh, they have all sorts of services that I want, actually, um, but build and manage sub subscription services, billing, track revenue, um, all for subscription-based companies. Um, before Zora, um, Tian was chief marketing officer um, at a little company called Salesforce.com, and uh, before you left, chief strategy officer as well, mm -hmm. right? Um, and finally, you guys know Nick, Nick Mehta, um, CEO of Gainside. Um, what you may not know, and the helmet was probably a giveaway, he's just an obsessive, diehard Steelers, Steelers fan. And That's right. At yeah. a moment's notice, this all his career has been a stepping stone to becoming the quarterback for the Steelers. I'm working <laughs> on it, exactly. Um, I don't know how that's going to work out for you, but we'll see. It's in progress, in progress. <laughs> um, well, thank all you guys. And um, so let's start, Chen, with you. And I, I, I kind of want you guys, again, from the CEO's perch, Let's define customer success. Um, you know, what does it mean to you? And I have a sort of a, a sidebar question too: is like, what would it mean to Larry Ellison? Uh, is he in the audience? What He's not. Larry Ellison? <laughs> no. Well, I had our customer success this year. We've been hiring people from uh, from a few companies, and um, right now is one of the companies we've hired from, and so. It was a, you know, there are people with the title, just like many people in the room, you know, customer success manager. And the running joke at the time we were interviewing them was, now that you're acquired by Oracle, are they going to change your title? And the first <laughs> time I asked that question, they were like, well, actually, they are. They, they're going to change our title to, uh, to, to, to inside sales. And so that's why there was a bunch of people that, that really headed for the hills. Uh, and so that answers your question as to what Larry Ellison <laughs> thinks about it. I mean, the other th story I'll, I'll share with people is, is this whole title customer success, you know, came from Salesforce. Right. And, um, you know, and we were wrestling with this issue of, of, well, how do we get our customers to really adopt our service, right? And, and at the time, churn rate was actually pretty high and adoption was really low. And we wanted to create a team of people to, to really focus on this. And, and we wrestled with what to call this team of people. And so we call them, um, you know, should we call them account managers, right? Should we call them sort of solution consultants? What do we really call them? And in uh, and, and classic Mark, he's like, well, look, the whole point is to generate customer success, so why don't we just call them customer success managers? And we went back to the team, and we said, oh, we're going to call you guys customer success managers. And everybody hated it, right? It was just <laughs> he's like, I don't want that title. I'm not going home. I can't tell my wife and <laughs> husband and kids that my title is now you know, head of customer success or customer success manager. And so it's kind of funny how um, that's, that's, that's really adopted. And, and, and you know, we really were trying to catch the, catch the spirit of it, that, that we wanted a team of people that really focused on nothing else but creating and customer did success. Did you know that one day there would be a secret society? We did not know. It's like the handshake, uh, and we'd be here amazing. sitting here in this conference. Okay. They, they had no idea. Wait, Nick, had no idea. Nick, I mean, you live and breathe this stuff. Give us your brief definition of what customer success is. Yeah, all right. Well, I actually wrote a haiku. <laughs> um, Very brief, I guess. So. <laughs> 
I knew Aaron Levy was you on stage. You had an unfair amount of preparation I for this panel. Exactly. Okay. I know, exactly. I had to. So I, I was 575, I believe, right? Hopefully I didn't w Wikipedia this wrong. She sleeps, eats rarely, world on her shoulders always, cleaning up for sales. <laughs> oh, wow. So that's, that's customer success. <laughs> okay, Aaron, in haiku form, answer the following question. Um, well, no, seriously. It, so it is, is customer success new? I mean, when I was talking to Nick, I'm like, aren't you guys just branding something that has been done all along? Um, is it new? And if so, what's new about it? Who's it to? Well, you are, yeah, uh, let's start he with you, Chris. threw it out there. You, 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 <laughs> let's start with you, Chris. I'll, yeah, I'll jump on that. I think, I don't, I don't, I think it is new. I think that, you know, you talked about uh, my background a little bit, and I came from the enterprise software world selling, you know, big, big licensed hardware, licensed software, the whole nine yards. And, you know, a lot of companies, including ones I've been at, pay lip service to it. And they talk about the customer and putting the customer first, and every CEO stands up and says that. But the thing I think you realize when you are a CEO of a SaaS company very early on is that if you don't take it seriously, you're, you, you know, that's a going out of business strategy. In the old right. days, you know, you could make up for, you know, churn basically by just selling the next big license deal, big license deal. And you, I don't want to say you didn't care, but you know, was, whether they went live or whether they went, whether they were using it or whether, whether they went live when you told them they were, I mean, none of that was in your control. And, you know, we just went and sold the next big deal. And uh, I think you've heard a lot today how valuable it is to keep the customer as compared to going and getting that next sale. And so I think it's different. I think it's unique to SaaS where you have to sing for your dinner every day, certainly every month and certainly every year. And, uh, and so I think it takes on a whole different meaning. Aaron, within Box, where does this rank in importance? Like how do you guys sort of when everybody sits down at the table, you know, who do you go to first and, and, and what follows? Yeah, I would say that, um, uh, uh, let's close your ears if you work at Box, so you can't argue with me no matter what I say. Um, <laughs> the, and also, shouldn't you be working right now? What's going on here? <laughs> okay. Um, uh, so, um, I guess Saturday you'll. Okay. Oh, okay. Fine. Okay. Uh, so it counts. Um, so I, I mean, every literally every single week we review uh, at our e staff meeting. So this is the start of the week, and um, uh, uh, it's uh, it's 11, 11 a.m. in the morning. Um, we, we launch into this, uh, so I've just woken up, and we are talking about <laughs> sort of what what is the sort of you know set of things that we're going to go out and do um, from a strategy standpoint, and review a lot of the things that have, have just happened. Um, and we review basically three primary metrics: we review sales pipeline, we review marketing pipeline, sorry, and we review customer retention and satisfaction. Um, and that's how we start our week off. So it's a top line metric. Um, that we run our business off of. Uh, frankly, it can be more infused throughout the organization. I think we're all probably you know, trying to do that more and more within our businesses. So how do you have uh, as much customer intimacy as humanly possible? Um, and you really can never have enough. It's, it's actually impossible to be, um, to be able to do that because there's, you know, for, in our case, we work with 150,000 businesses and um, 18 million users. And so we, the, it would be impossible to scale out that in, intimacy um, to, to reach what, what is actually possible. So what we try and do is we, we, we you know, use algorithms and technology to, to engage in that intimacy as efficiently as possible while producing the best outcomes for our customers um, possible. And I think the big shift, and I'll probably steal a, a teen uh, talking point in a second, but um, when you think about the economy that we've moved to, um, you know, Zora's big on this idea of the subscription economy and right. how that's, you know, dramatically changed, um, you know, business today. Our business is driven on customers coming back every single month and paying us. Um, which means that they have to be insanely satisfied. And then if you compound that with the fact that we have an abundance of technology and products in our world today, um, it actually then becomes not, a com not just a necessity to get them to show up again from a revenue standpoint, but a business imperative to actually stand out in the market. So um, it's not the, the case that you have some scarcity of technology today. I mean, like in the 80s when Oracle emerged, you know, the, the classic joke is, um, and I don't think this is a joke, is the sad part, um, they, they would ship people a CD, or not a, a CD, obviously, at the time. They would ship people disks of, of the Oracle tapes. database that were empty. Um, right, or tapes? Yeah. Yeah, and they, they would be blank so they could buy themselves more time um, <laughs> with the customer. Um, and so that just doesn't fly in, in an era where you can go tweet that, yeah, my tape arrived empty. Um, so that wouldn't, uh, 
And if you're getting tape shipped to you, you probably need a new vendor. So the, but the, <laughs> but the, 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 the we live in a world of, of an abundant, of abundance of information, an abundance of technology and products, and the way to stand apart from everybody else is to build the best possible customer experiences um, and create the, the best customer success from your, your products. And you know, I think we're now in an era where more businesses understand that, and we're going to need solutions and technology to help us actually manage that at, at scale. Team, I mean, does that ring true with you? And, and, and sort of as the kind of person who coined or among the people who coined this, I mean, is it sort of playing out as you saw it? And where are we in terms of importance now and, and how does it maybe grow? Yeah, uh, we, you know, I mean, this, this, this obviously is something that, that we evangelize. I mean, we look, sort of look at, at business and we think the 20th century, you're going to look back and say it was the anomaly, right? The 20th century was a world where, uh, you know, the seller and the buyer didn't have to know each other, right? As a manufacturer, you created a product and, you didn't really know who was going to use it at the end of the day. You're just sort of st stuffing it on store shelves and trying to stuff it into the channel, right? You're trying to, you know, the manufacturer try to get to the distributor, try to get to the wholesaler, or try to get to the retailer, the consumers. You know, you would ask them to fill out, a, you know, some sort of registration card, which they never did. And you didn't really know who they were. And that's just not the world anymore, right? And, and, and your customers know who you are. They're tweeting about you. They're talking about you on Facebook. And the marketing departments figured this out, you know, 10 years ago. Uh, and, and the reality is you've got a direct relationship with your customers and you've got to maintain that relationship and, and you know, the success of Salesforce and, and CRM is, is really, really, really a testament to that. And, and, and you just feel it. You feel it because, you know, we're walking around with our devices, you know, connected not just to each other, but to the brands and the companies that, that, that we use. I, I, well, go ahead, Aaron. Well, and, and, and can I steal one more part of your messaging? Sure. Okay, so I'm just helping you, I think. Um, you know, when you think about, in this new economy, you think about long-term, you think about, creating value out of long-term customer relationships. And to the finance guy, that's LTV, so um, lifetime value of a customer. Um, and so that actually allows you, I mean, it's actually a, a really good um, type of model because it allows you to do things that might be not near-term profitable for the relationship or might not be, you know, from a unit economic standpoint, what you'd want to do if you were just trying to make every single unit <laughs> profitable, which is what you had to do if you were only going to sell your customer once. But because you're trying to build value over a long-term relationship, it, you will do a lot of things that are sort of, um, uh, oriented around building the best customer experience possible because you value that long-term relationship. The, the great example um, outside of our industry is, um, I just saw a tweet the other day of somebody who um, embedded an image from Amazon. And if, you don't, uh, if you're an active Amazon customer, you buy a lot of things from Amazon, um, uh, if you ask for a refund for a product and uh, take back a product, um, there's actually, you know, depending on the price of the product, there's a chance that they won't even ask you to send the product back to them. Because right. it's just it, the cost of them right. going and, and doing all the inventory management and putting that back in their warehouse and having to restock it is not worth the just giving you, you know, instant gratification of that was a really great process and they know that they're going to make money on you. Did you tweet that leak? Yeah. Um, I, uh, you'll have to, I mean, hopefully search t Twitter search engine works. I don't know where it is anymore. So sorry. Uh, Chris, in the venture capital panel, and I think there were all VCs, they said that um, churn and retention from where they sit are as important as growth. From where you sit, Chris, is that true? And 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 if it is, well, answer that first. But but and how did you come to that sort of realization? I think. Well, so I think the answer is yes. I think that that churn is the most incredible you know gift that keeps giving. It's also the, the gift that can keep taking if you don't take it seriously. Right. Um, I would love to say that we started this company eight years ago and started selling customers and were focused on churn. We weren't. We were focused on just get the first customers, get them live, prove that this thing even works, prove we can sell it, prove that we can have a repeatable process to sell it. Um, we were very focused on driving to the lowest cost of sale, that, you know, all that kind of stuff. And but so you were focused on growth then, in, in other words, right? Yeah, you're, you're always focused on growth. I didn't have growth. any customers to churn. So. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you're, as a software company, you know, you're, you're either growing or dying. So, right. you know, absolutely you're focused on growth and anybody who says they aren't is, is, is missing it and won't be a CEO very long. So you have to focus on the growth. But what, you, what we had to learn, probably a little bit the hard way, was you know, about two years into the company, this idea that, gee, we're bringing all these deals in the front door and they're, they're walking out the back door. Like, whoa, what is going on here? And I think that's why I'm so excited about what Nick and, and his company now are doing is you know, to have the information and, and you know, these guys are talking about the usability of the product and knowing right. who's using it, knowing how often they're logging in, knowing what pages they're going to. You know, there's all this rich information that frankly, we, you know, A, we didn't have before, and B, now in the new model, you know, we have, it's hard to get to it. It's hard to, to, to see all that. And so once we started figuring that out and realizing, hey, there's this direct correlation between customers who are logging in every day and using it 
and then renewing, and the ones who aren't, not renewing. And so, right. like they said in, the, in one of the earlier panels, it's too late at the renewal to find out somebody's not renewing. I mean, right. you know, we, we now with the tools that are available and the, and, the, and the amount that you can see the usage statistics and stuff, you can see miles ahead. I mean, our churn is very predictable. I mean, those of you that were in the in the in the uh, one that just finished here, you you saw Bernie Kassar talk. Our, he, he's like our churn czar, you know, and and he's everything, all things churn. He's one of the, got one of the most important positions in our company. So just, we just add one thing to that. I, th I think trying to separate growth and churn um, is almost it's misleading in a way because they're obviously the, you know totally tied together. So the analogy is you know if you fly to the East Coast versus flying from the East Coast back here, have you noticed that it actually takes a little longer one way versus the other, and that's headwind versus tailwind, right? So you have wind at your back, and so how fast you're flying uh, on an absolute basis isn't as important as how fast you're flying with or without that headwind or tailwind. And the same way, you know, churn impacts your growth, right? So growth is, a part of churn is part of growth. And actually, if you look at the companies that grow the fastest, they add new logos and they grow their existing revenue. And there's no way to grow fast without doing both of those, in my opinion. Well, a dollar, I mean, a, a dollar, re retaining a, a dollar is, you know, should be easier than acquiring a new dollar right. Right, from that customer, from just the fact that you already have the relationship, they've already bought into your product. So then doing as much as possible to retain that dollar and hopefully increase it by producing a great experience is kind of everybody's incentivized to do that. So you, you have to have both at all stages of, of, a, of a company. And so I think that's one of the things that's so, so great about this particular model is, you know, it's not keeping the dollar, he's absolutely right. The cost to keep it is much cheaper than going and getting a new one. Right. But, you know, so much of the upsell and cross-sell and yeah. the ability to do these land and expand strategies where, you know, I think one of the VCs was saying, you know, hey, they're really focused on the revenue retention and, and the growth and maybe it's 120% and whatnot. And while I don't, while I emphatically disagree with the fact that, that CEO should be focused on that so solely, and, right. and I think that's a big mistake and a trap that CEOs, you know, look into and get caught in. It is, an, it is an important dynamic because it's more than just that dollar. It's, it's $1.40, yeah. you know, if you're upselling right. them and, you know, right. and whatnot. Aaron, um, you had mentioned that uh, you would like to infuse this more broadly throughout Box. And, and having said that, Tina, I want to ask you, how do you go about doing that? I mean, how, how do these people sort of have a better spot, you know, within sort of your your radar at the table, however you want to describe it. But then how does it bubble up and, and expand more broadly? Yeah, um, we're actually doing something right now. Sorry, April, for smile or smirk, uh, but it's not uh, a smirk. smirk. <laughs> <laughs> is that, a, um, that looked like a smirk, actually. <laughs> yeah, it did look like a smirk. I but, thought it was but, a smirk. But it's okay. Um, well, we've, we found that we were a smaller company, so we're about 250 employees now. And we're about 7,500, 125 employees. It was a lot easier just to get an intuitive feel for what we do for customers, right? But now we're bigger. And you know you want to slice you, your visibility as a slice of the overall customer process versus you know the whole thing, and um, and so so we're actually going to do this thing. It's going to be kind of expensive, and this is sort of the investment in customer success that the CFO, you know, always struggles with. But but we're going to take uh, the entire company employee base on a two-day offsite, and we're going to reconnect ourselves to what we do for customers. Hmm. And so we came up with. Um, we like, I like to call it customer bill of rights. I'm getting a little bit of pushback that it sounds a little bit like a New York yellow taxi cab. Uh, but, but there's nine things that customers really ex, you know, have the right to expect from us and in any system similar to us. And we're just gonna spend two days talking about it. And uh, we're gonna reconnect the whole company are you gonna become size back to that. Are you gonna become a customer company? Uh, <laughs> I think I don't wanna get sued from a trademark <laughs> standpoint. Aaron, how are you guys doing? Oh God, no, don't call me out. What, um, uh, so uh, there's a lot of things. Um, <laughs> there, you, I mean, it has to be up and down the, uh, and kind of across the organization. So um, the, the first thing is you wanna make sure, and, and this is the kind of thing that you find out over time um, when you have gone through a growth period, you start to see where are the breaks in the system, where have you not figured out all the right processes that are gonna help you scale to the next level. One small example is we have a compensation model on the sales side, which probably doesn't produce the most, the best sort of long-term, um, you know, value retention and creation right. for, for our customers, right? You have something where 
um, it incentivizes it incentivizes the the sort of initial sale and then upsell, but not necessarily the long term retention. And that was something because you know you take a, the early cohort of your sales process and it goes well, and then you kind of you know cascade that out to five times the number of reps, and it's harder to manage. So um, you need to make sure that that you have more of your business systems um, and business processes tied back to making sure your, your customers are successful. So we're we're going through that initiative right now. We do a lot of things. Um, we try. Um, looking at you, John, um, we try to um, uh, get a customer in to speak uh, on a monthly basis. So for the entire company, mandatory all hands Friday lunch, right. and they come in and talk about how they deployed Box and were incredibly successful and what can we do better and what problems do they have. And that's just something that you want every engineer, every product manager, every customer success representative, every sales um, uh, person uh, just deeply ingrained in thinking about how do we make our customers more successful? How can we build better products for them? How can we um, you know, produce better experiences? And then, um, and then you have to also just get directly involved and make sure that you hopefully set a good example for the kind of the kind of relationships that you want to be able to have with with customers. I mean, the biggest thing is constantly, um, constantly uh, iterating and optimizing. You know how we talk and how we work and how we communicate um, with with our customers and doing the, the best thing we can there. And it's um, again, a lot of times it's counterintuitive because you'll have an experience which isn't directly profitable for the company or isn't sort of directly economically wise from a pure just immediate rational standpoint but it produces long term gain for the, the business by having more evangelists as customers and so how do you how do you sell that though within your organization um, you, you really get people believing that 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 by producing in aggregate great experiences for customers and the only way you do that in aggregate is by doing that at an individual level right. that our company is going to be more successful that we're going to have more evangelists out there in the wild we're going to have more leverage from people saying great things about the product and the company and 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 when you frame it like that then everybody would agree that that is true if, if everybody has a great interaction with box and if you think about the i mean the interesting thing is is the most amount of touch points people have with a human at box is going to be in our success organization so right. you have to, we have to make sure that, that we have invested as much as possible in making sure that those interactions are going to be great. And that goes into the kind of people we hire, the kind of things and the latitude that we let them have um, around how they're going to interact with companies. I mean, you know, Zappos is the, the sort of quintessential example of this, but you, know, you don't see that kind of behavior and attitude a lot of times in enterprise software. And so infusing that as much as possible um, in a business that you know, traditionally hasn't been seen as uh, a very success-driven um, you know, kind of model is uh, is a huge differentiator, but also just produces way better long-term value for the company. Yeah, I, I would argue. This, I mean, you know, how, how do you infuse customer success in your organization? I mean, it's just it sounds a little silly if you kind of take a step back, right? Because I mean, that's the natural state, right? We're people. Yeah. We're people. Respond to other people, right? It's it's, and, and so if if you know if, if you ask any employee in your company, you know, and, and just pick a customer that you know, do you want that? person to be successful? Do you want to offer value? Do you want to build that relationship? People are naturally going to say yes. People are drawn to it. And so if you've got the opposite situation where your, your organization is starting to, 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 to be numb to it, right? that means there's something going on that's a, there's a depersonalization of the customer. There's a distance to the customer. right? But if you get your employees close to the customer mm -hmm. through whatever techniques that you want, I mean, the, the, you know, human behavior and human nature is going to take over. One other thing I'd add to that is I, I think that um, for every one of the companies in this room, cu the customer success, not as an organization, but as a goal, probably means something different. You know, so for some companies, it's the end user really loving the product, and it's others that the executive feels like they're getting value. Some it's both. And I think a lot of companies, as they grow, uh, lose touch with, as they get siloed, with what the bigger picture of customer success means. And I think an opportunity for CEOs is to kind of define what's the goal. Like mm -hmm. what, so you know, for our business, is it about making the end user happy? Is it about making the executive uh, sponsor and the customer happy? Is it about usage? Is it about just renewals? You know, what is, does it actually mean to us? A lot of companies, I think, as you get siloed, the sales team thinks one thing, customer success team thinks another, and that's how you, I think, lose touch with your customers. Chris, that, wasn't, that wasn't a haiku. <laughs> I know. Okay. I, I, I got <laughs> can, can you answer Chris's sort of question? Whose question? Well, Chris, I mean, I'm sorry, Nick's. Um, Nick's we're, we're, question. We look a lot alike, actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Chris, yeah. can you answer Nick's question? I wanted question? to talk about his, the way yeah. he compensates, because I think it must be challenging to do that, uh, you know. Aaron. What happened? All the compensation that you oh, do. It must okay. be, must okay. be challenging as hell. Sorry. No, I no, think. Can you answer Nick's question? Like, if the CEO knows what customer success looks like and smells like and, you know. I, I, I agree wholeheartedly with it. I, I think that, you know, people who view customer success 
what I don't like about the term customer success, no offense team, because <laughs> I, I didn't know you created that, so I'm very, that makes me even more, <laughs> you're my Not hero. customer for life. But anyway, I, I think but what's dangerous about that is thinking that only one department is, yeah. is, is, is care, should care. Right. Right. And I, I think that it's, it's got to be something that's pervasive across your company that's ingrained into the fiber of your culture. And, uh, you know, and as you get bigger, you're right, it gets harder. It's just like, you, you know, your culture, right? I mean, our culture is, you know, we think pretty cool, <laughs> you know, outsiders think it's pretty cool. We get a lot of, uh, uh, is, that, is that a good thing or is he telling me I shut up? I think that's good. <laughs> culture, oh, okay. culture, okay. culture. All, right. all right. Culture. Uh, the bingo, the bingo, the bingo you get <laughs> yeah, exit stage left immediately, okay. Uh, but, but I think, you know, when you look at these companies that are, that have, that are great places to work and that, that get the, that, that where the people are really happy to be there, uh, a lot of it has to do with how connected they feel to the vision and mission of the company. Right. And a lot of that has to do with is leadership paying lip service to some of these things or is leadership really <laughs> enabling them to take care of customers, right? It, you know, our core values, one of, we have four core values. The first one is care, is uh, customer focus. And we, it's not lip service. We, we literally, everything we do in the company is around who's caring for our customer, you know, who's, who's taking care of that. It happens in Bernie's organization, our churns are, but it happens everywhere else in the company as well. But to Nick's question, exactly when you say, look, customer success means this, does it mean that the executive, you know, is getting some ROI from it. It means. Does it mean the end user is, you know, ecstatic when when, when they're using exactly? I mean, well, what I think is it's, it? it's exactly what he said. It means different things to different constituents, right? And so, to the salespeople yeah. who we, pay, who who are paid through our system, right? There's hundreds of thousands of people all over the world paid through exactly. To them, it's about you know, when they open their iPad or their iPhone, that, that, that there's accuracy in their numbers, that there's transparency in how, how they're getting paid, right. and there's some motivational piece behind that that gets them to do their job. If they have a good experience with Exactly, then they're gonna go tell two friends and so on and so on, like the old shampoo commercial, right? right. So, you guys are too young for that, especially you, Aaron, but. The, Aaron, you know, Aaron definitely uses some shampoo. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what it is, but I wanna use it, yeah. Uh, <laughs> for our, for our, you know, the, the the super user, if you will, the admin that's managing compensation in our world, you know, it's all about that experience. Are they getting right. yelled at by finance and those kind of things? So the executives, the CFOs, you know, it's are they getting the ROI that was promised to them? You know, so I think it's different to each person, and we have to tailor, uh, you know, uh, not only our messaging, but but when we go and talk to those people, make sure that we're asking the questions that are relevant to them, and not just. How do you like it? Is it working? Does it pay accurately? Because in our business, it's got to pay accurately before you get out of bed. That, that's that's not that right. <laughs> big of a feat, right? right? It, it's 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 so many other things, and some of those are intangible. Um, I want to open this up for questions. So you guys um, get near a mic, raise your hands, um, and when when you ask questions, stand up, tell us who you are and and where you're from. Um, so think about questions. I have another question while you guys are thinking. Um, Will Customer success or CSM folks ever be as important as sales folks? I mean, I think the right thing to do is to say they already are. Um, <laughs> so I think that I think that gives me class. Okay. Or even more I think important, that is pandering um, my the, I, it, it all depends on 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 what metric you're talking about. I mean, new growth will always come from sales, and mm -hmm. retention and upsells will often always come from CSM. And the success of your business requires both to work in tandem and in concert. Um, and, I mean, I mean, we haven't even talked about the product and engineering integration in all of this, which is that you have to have all of your systems sort of firing all together. I think the I, th I think the you know, the myopic view is is that, you know, companies sort of build expertise in sort of one area or another. You know, Oracle's a sales company. Microsoft is a, you know, sales and distribution, you know, company. I think the to, to be successful and, and, you know, at some point in the curve, Oracle probably was good at it or decent at it. I mean, Microsoft at some point in the curve was good or decent at it. And I think the, the thing to maintain is, is to try and figure out how to maintain this is you have to be um, excellent on many fronts to be able to, to scale and be successful. It means you have to have engineering and product tied into customer success. It means you have to have sales tied into customer success. It means that the customer success department has to obviously be tied into all of the other organizations. So I, I think, um, I don't think there's, um, I think there's a push and pull and there's right. sort of a, a sort of a, a natural tension, um, but I think all organizations have to be firing on all cylinders for anybody to survive given how competitive um, these kinds of businesses and markets are right now. 
And one thing I want to add to that is, I think if you took it, take a look at what Teen talks about in terms of the subscription economy and, and um, you know, business models changing, one of the fundamental things that's happening is it's easier for customers to try new things out, right? Pay per month, so you're only stuck with a month of cost. You know, freemium, you don't pay anything, right? But it's also easier for people to leave and to leave you. And I would argue, and this is probably very self-serving, but everyone here is going to agree with me because we have the right audience, <laughs> that, that sales is actually getting easier and customer success is getting harder because it's easier for people to try new things out and it's much, much harder to keep them because they have so many options. I'm not saying sales is easy. All my sales reps here will be mad at me. But um, sales is very hard. And it's hard to convince people to part with a dollar. It's, that's a big deal. Are you guys burning like a sales statue later or yeah, something? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> okay, I didn't know. Okay. But, yeah, I, mean, I think I, I have a tough time even answering the question. I think it's, it's one of those, like, do you want your right arm or your left arm cut off? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> we offer I don't know how to answer that. You know, I, I can't. When I look around the table at our e staff, I, I do not place any greater value to the person running sales than to the person running, you know, responsible for customer success. I mean, right. to me, they're just, you know. The other thing I'd say, right the, the investors um, who all of us eventually, you know, at least partially resp uh, report to and have to respond to, they're getting more savvy about this. You know, you saw the panel earlier. So they're not just asking us about growth anymore. Right. They're asking us about churn. Right. So right. I think it makes it easier for us to kind of look at it much more equally as well. So let's go to questions from you guys. Uh, who's got a question? You, who I can't see, back there. Absolutely. I mean, I think I agree with you wholeheartedly. I think that more and more companies, you know, I'm in the comp world, so I mean, more and more companies are going to pay for performance cultures where they're using compensation outside of just sales and they're using compensation for things that are not just cash related and they want to do that more and more and more. And we've heard some of that even today in, in the different ways people want to pay and should pay the CSRs and CSMs. Uh, but I, for one, you know, at exactly every, just about every per person in my company and certainly the executive team to a, a very large degree is focused on three metrics and one of them is churn. And that, from the board down, you know, th that's our, a lot of our comp is based on that. I mean, I'll share a quick story there. Uh, a company will remain nameless, but, but, but uh, before they were pri recently public, they were a private company and, and, and their exec bonuses were based on, you know, ARR, churns, customer satisfaction. And then when they became public, because the, um, uh, the formulas for the bonuses needed to be published in, in, in the 10Ks and the 10Qs, uh, they changed it. They changed it to EPS, you know, sales growth or whatever, whatever they knew they were going to put into to, to their financial statements. And so, so there, there's something about it, that, that from a public standpoint, the traditional financial metrics still are steering you, right, towards a set of metrics that might not make sense, right, for these customer-centric business models, right, when it was all about, you know, the margin on a, on a unit of product, right, versus, you know, churn, renewal rates, ARPU, how satisfied the customers are. Right here, table 17. Hi, Gary, Sarah 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 uh, we, we, we have an office now in London, and we have customer success uh, managers out in London. Um, we would follow that pattern in, in any major market where we're going to go serve uh, from a customer footprint standpoint. So I think we'd see the same thing. You know, we're, we're looking at Japan as our next big um, kind of country that we're, we're moving into. We would have the same kind of uh, model. So we definitely want, you know, to drive customer intimacy. Um, there is a geographic and, and sort of proximity component to that. Um, and there's also just like an in-person component for larger customers. Um, so we, we absolutely would, would, uh, would follow wherever our, our organizational footprint is. Uh, quick question, when is customer failure okay? When is it, you know, we talked a lot about how, you know, you don't want some customers, but from where you guys sit. I want every customer. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I, don't, I think that's just a cliche, people say that. I, I don't get that. Um, I, I mean, I get the whole, let's fire a customer. I think it sounds funny and cool, but um, <laughs> to me, it's a little bit of a cop out. I mean, I, you know, unless you've, you know, just really screwed up the sales cycle and, and bit off something that doesn't make sense, 
you know, and even then, I think your core, our core values are accountability. You know, I right. said there was four of them. The second one's accountability. So if I tell you I can do something, I don't think it's okay to then fire you and say, "Well, sorry, I tried. I just can't, couldn't do it." Right. I think there's, a, I think there's some accountability that we have as a company. So I, I think our approach is we're going to move heaven and earth to try to get that customer happy. And I think where where we've had that situation and we've done it. We've earned a customer for life and beyond. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just like you know. Couldn't get rid of them if you tried. Yeah. So yeah. I, I don't know. I, that's I may, I, that may not be popular, but that's just my my position. Teen, do you agree with that? Uh, yeah. So 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 I, I, there's there's definitely the part I agree with where, you know, measuring the profitability of customers and firing the unprofitable customers that 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 really doesn't make any sense, right? And um, you know, the onus is on you to put forth a value proposition that could have worked. And you know, and you wind up with grandfathering some customers from your early days that are just getting a great deal. That's okay. You know, that 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 that's okay. Um, you know, but I I think you know what we talk about often it's 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 customer. It's we talk about it's about the relationship, right? And we, we do this, this this picture where look, is it is it about the customer, or is it about you, right? And you go through this phase where you you think it's all about you, and it's like no 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 okay. Then you think it's all about the customer, and then you don't you're not even in the picture. Right, and it's really about this relationship. It's about the relationship between you and the customer, and the relationship has to be, you know, a relationship that works for both, right? I mean, if you sort of save every single customer and go out of business, that doesn't make, make any sense either, right? right. And so, so, and, and so, you want to set up a relationship that works, and that relationship happens to has to be based on transparency and, and, and mutual benefit, right? And, and just be honest with it, um, you know. And, and 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 you have a philosophy that says, look, you know, because of my product vision, because of my technology vision, my value proposition, I believe that every company eventually will be a customer. But you know, sometimes it's it's it, it, it's it's a question of timing, right? right? Sometimes if you if you treat the customer right, they might go away and they'll come back in, in, in a year or two when your product is more mature, when you're ready, right? Um, and that's one, okay. One other thing I'd add is that, you know, looking at an individual customer and profitability, I think everyone agrees, is a little bit narrow-minded. It's even more narrow-minded when you think about the fact that a customer is actually just a bunch of people, and those people will probably have other yeah. jobs, yeah. right? And you look at, I mean, it's amazing. Just as a really simple anecdote, the company that did our video this morning, the, we did this Google Glasses thing, we'll show it to you later. It was fun. Um, and uh, I wore a football helmet. Um, <laughs> that's what I hear. And, you know, the company that did that video did the original videos for Box, and one of my employees at my last company went, uh, had to do a video for us. And then I came to this company and we used that video company. So literally three different generations where that relationship actually carried forward, right? And so you think about firing a customer, you're actually probably firing like 10 or 15 future cu customers as part of that process, you know? And I'm not saying it's always, sometimes it's not the right fit, but you'd better be careful about what you do because it can have pretty big consequences. More questions? So for me, I'd like to get, I'd like us to, to use the analytics more. Mm. I'd like to get the data more. I'd like us to, you know, really, um, you know, improve on our predictive uh, skills and, our, and, and, and be able to even productize some of the stuff with the data so that we can really communicate back to the, and one of the coolest things, I was, I've always been a customer of Salesforce for years and years and years since, since the early days. And I always thought it was really cool. They used to send me this email that said, you know, you're, you're using this many tabs or, or pieces of the app, but not these, right? And today, exactly, we don't do that. And I just think it'd be really cool to, you know, because you want to help educate them on how to use your product. And some of these products, you know, ours can get complicated. I mean, you're, you know, we're handling half a billion transactions a month for hundreds of thousands of people all over the world in 18 different languages and, you know, in 50 different currencies. It can get, get complicated. And so, you know, you lose the admin who, you know, wins the lottery or something and decides to quit. You know, the next person may not dig deep enough into the app and all of a sudden not be seeing value. And next thing you know, we're not paying attention and they don't renew. And it's like, whoa, whoa, time out. What happened here? You know? And, and so if we had the tools to be able to educate that person through the system, based on the data and usability. I, I think that's the future, and I think that's kind of the nirvana. Yeah, so, so uh, Tim Stanford's in the, in, in the room here, so you gotta be a little careful, but, but you also know this is true. But, um, you know, when, when, when you first put a customer success organization together, oftentimes it's like, you know, the sales guys who the customers love, right? But, you know, but they kind of glue onto the customer versus focus on the deals, right? 
or the professional services guys are sort of tired of traveling. And uh, you know, where the customers, they just have a really, really strong customer relationship. It's a very people-oriented thing. And you don't, you don't want to lose sight of that because you, you know, you gotta work with the customer base, you gotta talk to the, to the customers, right? But what you really have to do for customer success is to teach the organization. You gotta bring back all those experiences and teach the organization um, what they need to do, what, what the rest of the organization needs to do in order to create customer success, right? What products should they build? What features should they build? How should they be setting expectations in the sales cycle? How should they, they be marketing or positioning the product, right, yeah, up front on the website? And, um, and that's, that's, you know, an elevation. Or, or, or even, you know, not just teaching the organization, but teaching the customers themselves, right, through, through, through the metrics that we used to send out, uh, just to give people an idea, right? You know, what is it? What is your target? Because if you're in the, if, for your product, you can't assume your customers actually know, right, what is the best way to, to, to succeed with your product. And so how do, you, how do you really take that learning instead of just saying we're a bunch of account managers and we're throwing sort of bodies at it, right? How do you elevate that to a way of thinking about it that, that, that can permeate the organization all the way through to, to, to the customer experience? We have, uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm interested in kind of a few different things that we're trying to do over the next year or so. The first is we want to be able to serve, you know, our, our challenge at Box is we have lots of sort of segments of customers, large companies and smaller companies, and um, you sort of end up um, just through the natural organism of, of, of building a company and people focusing on the large revenue opportunities, you sort of start to go up market. And this is actually the classic kind of innovator's dilemma of, you know, you build up more complex products and more complex services. And so then you pay more attention to your larger customers and less to your smaller ones, at least, you know, kind of proportionally. Um, and that's a very dangerous, uh, you know, thing that can happen, which is that, you know, for really twofold. First, there's massive network effects in software, so you want to be able to serve all customers, but actually also small customers become big customers over time, so you want to be able to, to make them all successful. So um, a, a lot of how do we figure out, and some of it's using data, some of it's, um, you know, finding new ways to interact with our customers, but how do you support both, you know, a five and a 20 and a you know, 50 person business all the way up to when we're serving a 100,000 person company, and that's a really, really complex, you know, challenge. Um, when you have to be able to manage, you know, uh, you know, people's time and, and what they're going to go work on. So that's a big effort that we have this year. Um, you know, I'd like to see way more customer sort of driven anecdotes and stories in every conversation that we're in within the organization. So in product meetings and engineering meetings. And so that's a, a good way to know that you're on the right track with people knowing about what's going on in, in you know, actively in hundreds and thousands of customers. And so we, we're trying to infuse that way more into the, to the organization. The other thing I'd just add to the, to the last point about sort of firing a customer, um, it is really important to think about the network effects that, that all of, I mean, I assume most companies here are software companies or technology customers in some sense, yeah, so, or technology companies. So, you know, the, the really important thing is to realize that um, we all have our own network effects. Now, the network effect might not be as, you know, like a Facebook or a Skype where, you, you know, you get 100 million or a billion users on the platform and it becomes successful, but it might be in a specific industry. If you got everybody using this product, then you would be able to, you know, have a disproportionate impact in that space. Um, and that's how we think about things at Box, which is maybe on an individual basis, one customer might, might not be profitable, um, but not only will maybe its employees sort of scatter around over time, but actually um, it might be an important player in its industry. It might also then be, um, you want to have a net positive experience that they're gonna go tell about to others and build a lot more evangelism. And that's how you ultimately build sort of market leading companies is you have more and more of companies in the same space, in the same sector, spreading out um, and, uh, and using your technology and, and services. So, um, so we think a lot about how do we make sure we make as many people as successful um, on our platform as, as possible. Well, um, I want to thank the CEO Forum. Uh, <laughs> we're a little bit out of time. We we're traveling so, shows. You know, yes. yeah. I, I think uh, what we've learned, I mean, I think it's really we'll interesting. We'll be at a billing conference next week. So. <laughs> think about, you know, you, you guys all have your own network effects and so do your customers. And I think that's a really a interesting, important point. It's a great quote. Something to take away. And uh, so Chris, Aaron, Teen, Nick, thank you guys so much. Thank, thank you. Thanks.